Good evening, everyone. Well, let's kick off. I'll put the uh, share on. Woohoo! Right we done there. I need to share before I do that. <clears throat> so, hopefully, you can see that screen now. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so uh, welcome. Um, thank you for um, those that managed to brave the weather and get down to the museum. And for those that are with their red wine or similar, um, then I uh, hope you're enjoying it. Uh, to do So it's March, gosh, uh, clocks have gone forward. Um, and so we've lost uh, a bit of time. So it does mean that uh, things like our outreach with kids and things is sort of got, got into a bit of a hold for about six months. Um, there's still lots to do, daytime astronomy and that kind of stuff, but organising the nighttime observing is a bit more difficult now, um, just because of bedtimes and things. Um, but we've got uh, Mark McIntyre, who has kindly uh, joined us via Zoom from his home up in uh, Oxfordshire. Um, it was lucky we organised it that way. He is suffering from COVID. However, he's soldiering on. So thank you, Mark, uh, for soldiering on and being with us tonight. Um, so he apologises. He might be a little bit croaky but then all the best talkers are a little bit croaky because um, they're so excited with their subject. To do, and I've just got to make sure that my gadgets work again. It's not so I'll use, I know why, because I didn't click that. That's better. Uh, so the usual, um, so uh, the one thing to remember about going on to April is if you want to see anything interesting in terms of planets, go and look in the mornings. That's when it's all happening. Um, but there's loads to see still in the night sky. Um, but uh, you need to wake up early. But with the clocks going forward, it's not quite so bad. Um, our usual contact points, to just to remind everyone, and no one in the last month from the committee has run away. Yeah. We've managed to keep them all, so that's very good. Um, and our membership is 85. Um, so uh, find out all the information you need from Bath Astronomers' website, uh, or just drop us a line, email, messenger, or whatever. Uh, we usually respond quite quickly. Um, it's been a bit of a busy old month, so hopefully you managed to get involved in a bit of it. Um, we've had, um, this is Steve and his amazing EV scope that we had down at Weller, um, where we learned that if you just put one of these in the middle of a group of people, they ignore every other telescope and they go to the fully electronic one with the iPad integration and things like that. They may be wearing binoculars, but they're not using them. Um, you can see here people uh, in the backgrounds using white light. It all goes a bit chaotic. <laughs> We've actually had it out again, but we, we, we were a bit more controlled about how it was used. I think there is a way of using it which doesn't involve everyone just sort of crowding around it to see it and everyone staring at screen. So we can get the benefit of having such a nice piece of technology that really uh, does justice to some of the faint objects in the sky, which are harder with some of our ordinary telescopes. Um, but without the massive crowd draw, because I think the thing that's moving around very excitedly in the front here is actually prim. Um, but uh, I'm not absolutely sure that's you, but uh, that ghostly figure. Um, we've also uh, been out and about. So this is, I, I'm trying to remember which one. This is Oldfield, uh, Oldfield Park Scouts, uh, the Cubs we went to, and uh, we've got them doing constellations. So this is their attempt at Orion. Um, the, ignore the colours, um, we didn't make it that complicated, but uh, uh, we're getting them involved and so we had little finger lights and they were trying to make constellations and we did rocket launching and all that kind of stuff. Um, again, just to engage them and in this case we were doing part of their astronomy badge um, to help them with that. So this was their constellations, understanding constellations. Uh, we've also um, had, you get a photo of you from it, <laughs> I knew you were going to like this. Um, so we've also been out helping the Herschel Museum uh, here, and we had a solar day on the 20th of March, uh, where we were pretty packed out, not only with telescopes in the garden, but with also people in the garden. And so we had an afternoon from 12 till four o'clock, um, which was pretty packed. Um, actually 12 till three was pretty packed and it started waning, and, but that's because the sun was going down and the bars were open, I'm sure. Um, but it was really successful. And we actually had lots of laughter and giggles and chat, and it was, for an astro thing, it was oddly social, it was lovely. Uh, it was absolutely great. So lots of laughing, lots of giggling, lots of people seeing um, uh, sunspots and prominences in this case. And uh, Prim learned how to use my bodged 
uh, GT mount, which was trying to drive this Coronado. Um, but luckily, we've purchased a mount that you can use yes. in future, which does it automatically. Um, not only um, the adults and things, we actually had uh, groups of home educators come into the museum as well. So we did that, oh gosh, a week last Monday. Um, and they're doing, they were doing sunspots and we're doing all about uh, how time, you can calculate time using uh, sundials and the equation of time. So we're touching on GCSEs as well, uh, GCSE astronomy. Um, so that was good to have that group in there. And you can perhaps see in the gallery in the back there, we've got tables laid out where they were doing all their sort of making stuff and engaged. So um, trying to make it fun. And uh, we had the telescopes out again, uh, white lights. We had the Herschel wedge, an ordinary uh, barter filter, and we had uh, the Coronado in the middle. And um, so that was really good. And that's the second group of uh, home educators. We've just been, a third group just got in touch with us as well. So we'll be going forward <laughs> to May, probably doing something with them as well. So it, it's really good. And it, this is also, um, this was a paid for event. So it got revenue from the museum as well. So the museum's decided to close on Mondays. It's always been a quiet day. Um, they thought they'd try it out for a couple of months. It, it's, it has been as quiet as it has been before. And so they've closed again, but that's now going to be the school days. And this is their first school day that we organised for them. So that's great. So they got some revenue off that. And so that was really nice. Um, we also did took the home educators out to uh, Moncton. So here we've got the telescopes all set up, um, ready to uh, have a look at all the bits and pieces. And we've got a mix here of Moncton's equipment. We've got um, the EV scope uh, just at the back there. Um, as well as uh, uh, one of our telescopes as well. So a good combination of sort of scopes. And we just had people just looking around and wa wandering between the different telescopes to see different subjects. So we're kind of getting our observation, our outreach thing pretty sorted. We're almost ready for the general public. I think perhaps they're better um, behaved than some of the kids that we had. Um, <laughs> they were handful. There were a group that were handful, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've also been out, uh, so I took the solar scopes to um, something called the Greenhouse Project, which is another homeschooling um, group, um, and they're based out in Bitten, and they have they actually got classrooms uh, in uh, delivery stables. <coughs> so uh, we were doing solar observing, rocket launching there as well. Can um, I just ask them, are, you yeah. new, are those telescopes, are they all members' telescopes that you take along? Uh, so uh, the, the two on the right hand side are belong to the museum right. um, and it's kind of we, we we're the manpower for running their telescopes so they, they purchase them they're their assets right. but we utilize them that means we can also take them out right. and use them for other outreach events that's the kind of the deal we've got. Uh, this one happens to be mine uh, just on the end um, so just a, again a combination of the different types of telescope you can use and the other reason for bringing this, well, I don't really need to bring this, but in terms of demonstrating things like uh, refractors versus reflectors, it's quite good to have different types uh, when we do these kind of things. Um, we also are... I was going to say we have the loan scheme as well. Oh, yeah. So, we, we, yeah, we do have um, telescopes that you can borrow from, the, um, from us. So, actually, there's two. There's ETX90 is, is available. I'm going to pick up the Celestron, I'm trying to remember what it is. Oh, it's something like a one, two, three LCN, or oh, that's some kind of code like that. Anyway, um, this is Charles, and uh, I, I think they might have been students from the university, but it was part of um, the evening, uh, the 241st anniversary of the discovery of Uranus, um, which we did on the 13th of March on the anniversary date outside, and that's with the replica telescope um, that uh, we <coughs> carefully. Uh, moved down here and carefully used whilst we were down here and this is the uh, telescope ever so slightly broken uh, <laughs> you can see that the the uh, rack we've got here isn't quite lined up with the the sort of the line behind it uh, which is on the octagon that's because it's kind of stuck and it's just leaning over slightly um, <laughs> myself the assistant curator dismantled the telescope and fixed it um, but boy, was I in trouble. Uh, <laughs> it is fixed now, and we now understand exactly. It's it's a mistake anyone could have made. I've made it. Someone else has made it. No names mentioned. Me. That was me. It was me. 
<laughs> um, and we know exactly what we've marked it now. It's basically, if you overwind it, it just comes out of the mechanism and then a little piece of metal just falls underneath it and it won't go back in again. So you have to dismantle it down here to get it all to fit again. Um, so I've kind of been forgiven by uh, Ellie, but uh, we'll just have to, so Ezzy, uh, we'll have to see. Izzy, go. Uh, we've also been to, um, gosh, through really, this was Bitten, uh, scab, uh, Cubs and Scouts, and um, that was a very energetic bunch. Um, and so we did lots of rocket launching, lots of explosions going on all over the place. So that was kind of cool and fun. And uh, we've been back up, we've been uh, with the uh, Bath Abbey, we've done two more tours, um, each of a pair. So there's four more tours that we've done on top of the Abbey. Uh, showing the American tourists, all tourists, locals as well, uh, the night sky above the Abbey. Um, on the second occasion, at least, uh, we were lit up by the Ukrainian flag, which is wonderful and, patri and, and really supportive. It's a, just a nightmare for light pollution. <laughs> um, so uh, put it like this, we didn't see much of those nights in terms of anything faint. Uh, it was all bright stars, doubles and things like that. And luckily the moon came up as well to save the day. Um, and also, uh, in your name, I've been supporting. So this is an event that was for the Southwest Eating Disorders Association, um, where um, they contacted Wells and Mendip astronomers, and they wanted some extra telescopes. So I took some down, um, and so Wells and Mendip and Bath astronomers were doing this. And Suedo organised uh, they uh, this fundraising thing. They had about seventy or eighty people, and they raised a thousand pounds for uh, the Suedo charity. Which was kind of nice. So, um, not our, not only for us, but we do loads to the community as well, and uh, it's kind of cool. And uh, last weekend, you can see she's just been to the shops to get her greens. Um, I did a pop up um, solo event up on uh, Kim Down and the Firth and Kim Down, um, and just had them plonked in the middle, and I was just sitting there, and people just came along, and we just chatted about the sun for uh, two or three hours. So. Kind of got the rhythm of it, so we can do loads more of that, sort of um, how to manage it, how to do crowd control. Um, so uh, loads of fun uh, mm -hmm. for people just seeing the sun for the first time and seeing it safely, um, which is good. OK, so uh, that, that's what we've been doing. Uh, what could you do the rest of this week? Uh, well, I just want to mention that um, the Herschel Society has a talk um, this coming Friday. Um, uh, what is the title? The Water Cycle of a Cold Early Mars and Its Potential Role in the Persistence of a Northern Ocean. That's a mouthful. <laughs> but I'm sure Dr. Stephen Clifford can um, explain it. Now, you can go you get to that in two ways. Just uh, turn up or uh, Brilsey, but actually you need to get a ticket. So if you go to the Brilsey website, you can get a ticket there and you, you can choose either to go in person or online. And if you choose the online one, um, as members, uh, we are affiliated to the Herschel Society in effect, so um, feel okay to put you are a member, and um, then it will be £3 instead of £5 if the charges are still the same. Uh, alternatively, the World's Amendment of Astronomers have invited us to their Messian Marathon, uh, which is at Oak Hill Village Hall, which is about 25 minutes away. Um, uh, so th and that's on this Friday, and they're going to try and set the scopes up and sort of do as many messier objects. So uh, that's uh, sort of like the 110 galaxies, nebula, uh, open clusters, globular clusters that uh, Charles Messier um, started the list of um, a few hundred years ago. And people have completed it um, or taken it up to 110. So try and get a few of those, bit of a giggle, uh, see what kind of astro trip people have got. Um, just have a chat and it's next to the village hall which is they've got open access so uh, Chris Starr will do a talk there as well so it depends um, you've got highbrow and maybe a little lowbrow um, so depending which one um, the highbrow is actually a, an easy walk um, this is a bit of a, a hike 25-30 minutes in the car um, but uh, you're perfectly welcome at either of them okay um, in terms of stargazing um, the, uh, the weekends without too much moon are listed here. So uh, if you're on the observing mailing lists, then I'll be sending out uh, items here. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't sure whether I was actually going to be around this weekend, but I probably am going to be around this weekend. So I'll come back on uh, what the options are uh, for this coming weekend. But um, we've missed a few at Moncton, so I'll put those back in and uh, as well as usual. Okay. Um, these are the same dates that are in the newsletter. So if you've got the newsletter, then you've got this. Um, things for April, well, you, 
you can read our beautiful newsletter. Um, we're going to try and I'm going to try and sort of get a few more of the sort of sidewalk events going. So just stop some. If you know somewhere which is kind of has a, a throughput of people, and it could be things like Sainsbury's car park, just asking permission. We did that for Mercury Transit or that kind of location, um, and uh, just where people what are they up to and just come and talk, and that's all we want. So um, there are. Uh, if, if you don't want it and sort of like a, a sort of very busy thoroughfare, but where people come out or something and they're just about to do something else, but they, they've got that moment just to catch your eye. So little parks are great as long as they've got um, uh, a decent sort of volume of people moving in and out. And that's great. Um, the most attractive thing about having telescopes set up is actually having people around them. So once people start going to them, you suddenly get this more and more people go to them. That odd person over there, odd people over there are worth talking to because there's a crowd around them. What else have we got? And um, these are from Steve's uh, Evo. So um, let's get loads of this. Is, this is traditionally um, end of March, early April is when we look at the faint fuzzies. Um, so have a look. We can uh, get some scopes set up to look at some galaxies and things like that. And if we ask nicely, then uh, Steve might bring out his EV scope again uh, to do photos like these um, over a few minutes, which is kind of fun. Uh, and um, uh, on the 5th, you've got some fun stuff happening in the morning. So uh, if you're up at six o'clock in the morning, and you've got a really low uh, eastern horizon. You might want to have a look at Venus, Saturn and Mars all together in the morning sky. Um, so that's probably worth having a look at if you... Do mind, I don't mind getting up at six on the fifth. Um, effectively, they're tracking across each other at the moment, but their closest approach is going to be on that morning. Okay, um, we put some ideas out what you wanted information. So over and above these kind of chats, um, and we've got some answers. And effectively, there's a whole load of potential sort of topics. So what I'm going to do is organize a few of these and sort of have a couple of talks back to back, or maybe do them on Zoom, but just give you a, a different ways of actually consuming these, but sort of getting to know your way around the night, uh, sort of like how does the night sky work? Um, what could you see right now? Simple stuff, 20 minutes max, uh, sort of sort of quick intro talks rather than sort of long wieldy things. And um, hopefully that makes sort of like, is, is what you need rather than sitting down for an hour and being bored out of your mind uh, by people like me. Okay, so um, next month we've got um, Chris Starr uh, coming to talk to us. He's the same chap who will be doing the introductory talk um, at um, uh, Oak Hill on Friday. Um, but he's the chap who um, actually founded the Wells and Mendip Astronomers uh, back in 2013. And he was their chairman for seven or eight years. Um, so he stepped down from that role a few years ago. Uh, Hugh Allen took over, but Chris is going to come to us. And he's really a sort of opponent of some of the stuff that you may have missed, some of the things that um, uh, some space missions, they, they discovered a whole load and the news media, they gloss over a lot of them. So he's going to come to talk us about what the Cassini mission around Saturn actually told us about Saturn. So that's going to be there. Now, I've been yabbering for way too long. It's a surprise no one's yonked me off um, and sort of uh, said, let's get uh, Mark on now. But um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Mark, um, Mark McIntyre. Now, we've actually had Mary McIntyre come and see us um, last year. Um, I'm trying to remember what her talk was on. Do you... Women in astronomy. Women in astronomy, yeah, okay, yeah. And she does um, Shadows in Space, and that was actually for, I think that might have been for uh, Wells and Mendip, but um, an extremely uh, prolific speaker. But uh, uh, she's, uh, uh, she uh, met in 2011 this lovely chap called Mark, and in 2016 they got married. They are both absolutely mad astro buffs. Uh, he's an um, astronomer dash uh, astrophotographer, and um, his experiences go back, I think, to about the age of nine. Is it, Mark? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was where you got yourself a three-inch telescope, and then you broke it. That's, that's what all good astronomers do. You get kit, and you work, try and work out how it works, and then you can't put it back together again. <laughs> you lose bits. Um, uh, but you actually, uh, I think that, that, that was this picture that I've got up here, that that's when you were 12, is it? Around that age? Yeah, it's around that age after I'd figured out how to reassemble the telescope and replace the missing parts. 
<laughs> but yes, uh, he's, it's sort of, uh, just like everyone, um, he's sort of like uh, he's, his hobby has grown. There'll be times in life where you sort of have to put it to one side and he's come back to it. Um, but uh, since uh, um, uh, meeting uh, uh, with Mary, it's sort of become absolutely manic everywhere. Mary is extremely prolific on talks. She's dragging Mark along. But one of the things, one of the reasons I actually know Mark is more from his emails and things, because I am part of, uh, I've got five cameras on the UK Meteor Network um, up in the south of Bath. And whenever they go wrong, then, or someone else's go wrong, I think there's 100 in the UK now of these cameras. Is that right, Mark? 140, in fact. 140? Four zero? Yeah, four zero. Okay, I'm well out of date. I'm, I'm 40 out of date. Um, the emails, there's a, there's a big uh, sort of uh, group on uh, sort of, uh, I've got a problem with my camera. And the fixing emails, most of them, or a great deal of them, come from Mark. So you need to do this. So he's sort of um, uh, mad keen on supporting those, uh, those owners of all those telescopes looking for meteors. Um, but also he's writing um, and sort of uh, improving on some of the code that's been written to aggregate all of that data and uh, to bring it back so that uh, you've got a pretty camera that you put up, but how do you get the data from it? Well, all the data gets sent to a central server and marks one of the boffins, one of the elves behind the scenes that actually make sure that it's all working. So that when you go and click on, oh, what happened to my uh, uh, cameras tonight, or uh, well, last night, up comes a wonderful demonstration of sort of all the meteors that got caught, et cetera. So it's a huge effort, but in terms of uh, contributions, Mark is uh, a significant contributor to that whole network. So thank you very much. And so it's probably appropriate, Mark, that you come to talk to us on the subject of meteors. So my idea is gonna stop the share there, and hand over to you, Mark. Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming to see us. And uh, you can give us an observer's guide. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. Hopefully you can see my screen. <clears throat> yep. Okay, so first of all, I must apologize if I get a bit croaky. As, uh, as Simon mentioned earlier on, I've, unfortunately I tested positive for COVID today after feeling terrible for a few days um, and my chest and voice are definitely going. So apologies in advance. Um, if I do get croaky. Um, so Simon has already given me a fantastic introduction, uh, just a quick resume here, um, just uh, to mention that I am also the Meteor Section Director for the Society of Popular Astronomy uh, in the UK, um, and as Simon has mentioned, I'm a member of the UK Meteor Network, and I'm also a member of the Global Meteor Network, which is a kind of umbrella organisation spanning meteor detection organisations all around the whole world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the video meter detection that we do in those networks later on in the talk. Um, I'm going to start, though, um, by talking about what meteors are. I mean, I'm sure many of us know what they are, but uh, I think it's worth just discussing that briefly first. And also talking a little bit why, about why we're interested in them. Um, and there are, three, there are three sections to this talk. The first section, what they are, why they're interesting. Second section, how to observe them. The third section, if I've got time at the end, I will talk a little bit about the Winchcom event too. And I must apologize in advance. There'll be lots of threes coming up in this talk because scientists like threes. It's a good number. Um, and, um, and so you'll see it quite a bit. So what are meteors? Well, if you look out in the night sky um, on any night of the year, you will typically see one or two meteors um, probably every hour. Um, if you've got sharp eyes, you'll see a few every hour. The vast majority of those kind of random sporadic meteors that you see are bits of asteroid. Um, they're just bits of rock from mostly from the early times in the solar system. Um, um, where did they come from? Well, most of them came from collisions that took place between asteroids, usually billions of years ago. And when I talk about collisions between asteroids, this is the kind of thing that quite often springs to people's minds. Um, this uh, extremely scientifically accurate representation of an asteroid field um, is the kind of thing that people tend to think about. You've got big chunks of rock flying around everywhere. Uh, it's extremely dangerous that a collision is taking place all the time. Spacecraft are dodging amongst the rocks, uh, trying not to run into things. Um, of course, this isn't at all what the asteroid belt is like. Um, if you were actually in the asteroid belt today and standing on one of these asteroids, you probably wouldn't be able to see another asteroid uh, visually at all. Uh, they're about a million kilometers apart on average, and they're very dark as well. So the kinds of collisions and the kinds of incidents that we're seeing 
uh, in this uh, extremely accurate movie just don't happen uh, today in, in the asteroid belt. I mean, they happen, but not very frequently. But things were different way back um, at the big, sorry, I'll just skip on from that if I can. Things were a bit different way back on in the early days of the solar system. The asteroid um, field was probably denser. Things were closer together. And so the majority of the meteors that we see in the night sky today are bits of those early collisions of asteroid. And I'll come on again to the age of those collisions uh, a little bit later. There are other sources, of course. So you also get bits that have been knocked off other planets. Um, and um, I'm sure we've all uh, seen bits of things like Vesta. Um, this is a piece of Vesta. I'm sticking with the Star Wars theme here because it's from Tatooine. Um, but uh, I, again, collisions between um, asteroids or minor planets early on in their, their lifespans. Um, other planets as well have been impacted by uh, asteroids. This is a picture of uh, a crater on Mars. I think it's in Argyra Planitia. It's about 800 kilometers in diameter and about 16 to 20 kilometers deep. So this is an enormous impact. And you can imagine an impact of this size is bound to have thrown rocks out into space. Um, and some of those pieces of rock have been floating around the solar system for thousands, millions, probably giga years. Um, and sometimes some of them have landed on the Earth. And this is a tiny piece of a Martian uh, meteorite that's actually in my collection uh, here at home. And obviously the moon has also been impacted by meteorites during, I'm sorry, by asteroids and chunks of rock during its history. Um, and how do we know these things are from Mars or from the moon? Well, certainly in the case of the moon, we know that because we can compare them to the samples that the Apollo astronauts brought back. So those are some other sources of, of uh, the meteors that we see in the night sky. Now, there is one other source, and um, which is the cause of most of the meteor showers that we see. So meteor showers, of which there are about a dozen big showers every year and hundreds, literally hundreds of smaller showers, they are mostly cometary in origin. Um, so uh, I'm sure we've all seen pictures like this. This is a picture of a um, comet that was um, in the night sky a couple of years ago, three years ago now, I think. Um, and you can see here that uh, in, as well as the comet's nucleus, you've got an ion tail going in one direction, a dusty tail going the other direction. Now, if that comet is a periodic comet, so it's going around the sun in a, a reasonably stable orbit, it'll be depositing dust behind it and that dust will build up over years and years. Um, <clears throat> And eventually you'll wind up with quite a thick dusty trail there. And if the Earth passes through it, like we pass through the debris from Halley's Comet, then you'll get a meteor shower. So those are kind of two different origins of meteors. You've got meteors, sporadic meteors, which are mostly asteroidal or pieces of other planets. And you've got meteor showers, which are mostly coming from comets. Um, and I'm sure you all know this as well, but meteor showers named, uh, typically they're named after the radiant, which is the place on the sky they seem to come from. If you look up at the night sky during a meteor shower, all the meteors will seem to radiate out from one particular point on the sky. That's obviously a line of sight effect. They're actually coming pretty much parallel straight toward us, but just like if you stood in the middle of the road and two cars went past either side of you, they would appear to diverge as they went toward, toward you and then passed. It's the same kind of effect there. So that's a bit about the origins of meteors. Um, a few facts about meteors, which uh, people maybe aren't aware of. The first thing is that pretty much all of the meteors you see in the night sky weigh a very small amount, um, a few fractions of a gram. The, the brightest meteor you can see in that picture on the right, I think weighed about a hundredth of a gram. Um, so they're pretty tiny. Um, and the reason that they create so much uh, heat and light when they burn up in the atmosphere is how fast they're going. I mean, they're traveling typically between seven to 10 kilometers per second, right up to 75 to 80 kilometers a second. And that's pretty speedy. So you can imagine even if something weighs a gram, if it's hitting the atmosphere at that kind of speed, there's gonna be a lot of energy dissipated. And that is what causes the bright flash of light we see. Sometimes you can even hear sound from meteors. I've not heard one myself, but you can uh, hear sound from meteors. Um, and sometimes they leave a visible trail behind them. Um, there was a picture shared on Twitter, uh, I think today, one of my colleagues in the Global Media Network in Germany captured a short video last night or the night before of a fireball meteor, uh, which left a train behind it, which persisted for about 20 minutes, looks like a twist of smoke in, in space. And that's the dust that the meteors left as it burns up, just floating in our atmosphere. But it was there for about 20 minutes. And, and that's pretty cool when you manage to see that. Um, and the other thing to mention about meteors is that there are typically several thousand tons of meteors hit the Earth every year. So if I go back to that earlier point about how much they weigh, 
if you've got a thousand tons of meteors, uh, but each of them weighs less than a gram, that's a lot of meteors hitting the atmosphere every, every day. <clears throat> of course, about half of those are happening during the daytime, so we can't see them. A, half, a lot of those are happening over the Arctic or the Atlantic Ocean or the Antarctic. So again, we don't see them. Um, but there's still a lot of meteors that, that are uh, hitting the Earth. Um, and, and I'll come on to, again, why that's something that's of interest to us in a little bit. Um, I wanted also to give you a few facts about meteorites. Um, so meteorites um, come in threes. I mentioned threes earlier on. So yet again, I'm going to talk about threes. So there are three real main groups of meteorites. There's iron meteorites. Um, and this is an example of an iron meteorite, again, out of uh, our collection here at home. Iron meteorites uh, typically come from the cores of smashed up planets or planetesimals. If I go back to the, the earlier part of the solar system when planetesimals were maybe being formed out of the, the sort of dusty gas that was surrounding the, new, the newly born sun, those planetesimals would have been having collisions and if they collided and smashed each other up, the molten iron that was at the core of those planetesimals would have formed little chunks of rock which we find today as iron meteorites. The second group of meteorites are stony iron meteorites. And these, again, probably come from collisions between planetesimals. You know, at the edge of the core of a planet, there'll be an area where there's rock and iron mixed together. And that's where probably these meteorites came from. And together, the iron meteorites and the stony iron meteorites are only about 7% of all the meteorites that we've recovered on Earth. The vast majority are uh, stony meteorites. Um, and this is a piece of Chelyabinsk that, that, again, we have in our collection. Um, and this is a sort of fairly typical stony meteorite. Um, and these mostly are, are from the, the outer parts of, of those um, planetesimals or the asteroids that I've been talking about. And again, stony meteorites are divided into three main groups. Um, uh, scientists do like threes, as I said. Um, the first group are what are called achondrites, and they mostly come from the surface of other planets or asteroids um, like Vesta or Mars or the Moon. Um, and they're called achondrites because they don't have something called chondrules in them. Now, chondrules are little uh, droplets. They look like little spherical beads inside the rock. And they're actually made of melted silicate that has re-solidified and then been mixed with all the other stuff that the rock contains. And the sort of meteorites that you get uh, with those in are called chondrites. Um, and those are the oldest of all the meteorites that we, we recover on Earth. Um, Mostly they're about four and a half billion years old. They date from pretty much around the time of the solar system's formation. And in some cases, they even predate the solar system. There are certainly parts of, of chondrites which we've dated to be older than the sun. And I think it's pretty amazing that we can hold in our hand a piece of rock that's older than the sun. And the, the rarest type of meteorite of all are the carbonaceous chondrites. And these are, uh, uh, the, again, a sort of chondrite, but they frequently contain organic compounds uh, and carbonaceous material. And this is a tiny fragment of a carbonaceous chondrite from Northwest Africa. Uh, that's again about the size of a grain of sand, that. Um, I'll talk a bit more about carbonaceous chondrites shortly um, when I come on to uh, a couple of other things. So I've talked about meteorites and meteors, but I probably should explain what they all are. Um, and the first thing I should mention is meteoroids, which I've not talked about so far. So before it hits our atmosphere, the piece of rock or the, the, the grain of dust that is going to form a meteor is called a meteoroid. So floating about in space, it's a meteoroid. Then it hits the atmosphere, uh, starts to burn up, and it creates a meteor. And that bright flash of light is the meteor. And if it doesn't completely burn up, and some of it actually makes it to ground, then it's a meteorite. So meteoroid in space, meteor in the atmosphere, meteorite on the ground uh, is, is the way it works. And this picture here on, of the meteorite is actually a tiny piece of the Winchcombe uh, meteorite, which um, is now on display in the Natural History Museum. So I've talked a bit about what uh, meteors are and what meteorites are, but what can they tell us? Why are we interested them in, in them in the first place? Well, actually you've had some clues already. So the first thing, obviously, is they tell us about the origins of the solar system, particularly when we're looking at the chondrites and the carbonaceous chondrites. They tell us about what the conditions were like in the early solar system. If you look at this, uh, this is an actual picture uh, taken by the ALMA telescope of a protoplanetary disk around uh, another star. And you can see that there's a lot of hot dust here. This is taken in the infrared, this picture. There's a lot of hot dust here with different temperatures. There's gaps in the dust. Um, and by studying uh, meteors and meteorites, we can get an understanding of what the conditions were like in that, that 
that early part of the solar system? How hot was it? What was the chemical composition? How did the chemical composition and temperature change as you went from near the star to further out? Um, and so that's an extremely interesting, uh, interesting thing that we can learn. And one of the things that's interesting about particularly the chondrites is they're quite often not solid objects in, in the sense that we might think. They're usually something like a conglomerate. So this is a good example. This is a slice through a chondrite. And you can see immediately when you look at this that it's made up of lots of different materials of different colors, different sizes, different textures. And by studying all those different pieces, we can learn an enormous amount about you know, what was going on in, in the early solar system. The other thing that's interesting about, um, from the point of view of the origins of, of things, is that early in the solar system, the Earth was bombarded with material from outer, the outer solar system. Uh, we know this from, you know, from the historical record, from the, um, uh, the record in the rocks. Um, and there is some possibility um, that the water and the organics that helped kickstart life may have been delivered to the Earth from that bombardment. Now, I don't think it's completely certain yet. I think there's still the jury's still out on it. But if that's the case, then it may have helped kickstart life. And if it kickstarted life, then it's really interesting for us to understand more about the chemistry of this material. And obviously, when we have a sample uh, of a meteorite that lands on the Earth that's been floating around for four and a half billion years, it's probably pretty pristine. It's probably not been polluted too much by, by anything else. It's just been floating around in space in a vacuum. And so it gives us a, a window onto the past. The other reason that we're interested in meteors and the meteorites is it gives us an idea of what other planets are made of. If you think back to the 1950s, uh, we had uh, no space missions. We had not been to the moon. We hadn't been to any other planets. We haven't really been to very many other planets even today. And so all of our information about what other planets might be made of and how they might be structured really came from visual observations or from spectroscopy. But if we can get a hold of chunks of uh, asteroid or meteorite, that gives us some information about what, what those bodies are actually made of. Um, and say so until space missions were able to actually go there, that was the primary way that we obtained uh, this kind of information. So this is a bag full of bits of the Winchcombe meteorite. Um, and as you can see, it looks like a whole load of black rock. Um, this is a, a, a sample that was returned from an asteroid quite recently. And I think it's pretty obvious looking at these two, how similar they are. Um, and so that, first of all, that tells us that the Winchcombe meteorite is probably pretty pristine, probably in pretty good condition. And secondly, by looking at these two samples, which we know have slightly different origins, we can again start to understand a bit more about the composition of asteroids, how that might vary depending upon where they come from in the solar system, and all that kind of thing. Um, so that's something else that these, these specimens are really interesting for. And in fact, these, these two specimens that you can see here are both being studied at the Natural History Museum at the moment, and the pictures are, are courtesy of Ashley King at the Nat History Museum. Um, very envious of that guy because they literally had the Ryugu mission sample lined up to come to them and then the Winchcombe event happened and then they got two samples to look at, which is fantastic. Um, the other thing that uh, studying meteors, meteors and meteorites is handy for, and, and apologies to Phil Platt for stealing the title of his book here, um, Death from the Skies. Um, by that, I'm talking really about the danger to the Earth from uh, asteroids uh, that, that we don't know about at the moment. So this is a picture of an impact crater in Africa. I don't know the exact scale of this picture, but there's a two pretty big impacts that took place. And we know from studying the records that there are many places around the world where there were impacts that, that struck the Earth and quite often caused you know, climate change or catastrophic events that, that impacted animal and plant life. And so we'd like to know more about what risks there might be that are out there. And a good way to do that is by studying meteors, meteor showers in particular. So I'm going to take an example of the Southern Torrids. Now, the Southern Torrids are created by uh, a comet, uh, 2P Enk, and some researchers suggested that comet 2P Enk is not the only body in that orbit. There's a possibility that there are other parts of, uh, of, of whatever the parent body of 2P Enk is floating around in, in a resonance with Jupiter. Um, and what we see as the Southern Torrid meteor shower is just part of that intersecting with the Earth's orbit. So obviously, if there are other large bodies out there somewhere in the solar system in the similar orbit to the southern torrids, we'd quite like to know about because those could be on an impact uh, trajectory with the Earth. And so by studying the southern torrids and understanding how their orbits have evolved and how they're changing and what the composition of them is, we can get a better idea of whether there's a potential risk and what we could do about it if there was. 
Uh, not much, I don't think, but it's good to know about these things. So that's another thing that's very important about, uh, about meteors and why it's useful to study uh, meteor showers and meteorites and understand more about the dynamics that's going on there. So I've talked about what meteors are and I've talked about why we're interested in them. And so I wanted to come on to how we observe them. And um, I'm going to start off by visual observing. And that's the most basic form of observation. And anybody can do this. You don't need any special or fancy equipment for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've listed here my uh, essential equipment. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off with a deck chair or garden recliner. And the reason that I say a deck chair or garden recliner is that you're going to need to be lying, looking up at the sky. And you don't want to be sitting in a kind of an ordinary garden chair with your head tipped back, hurting your neck for hours on end. So a good deck chair or garden recliner that you can tip back and look up at a, at a good angle at the sky. You're going to want a blanket and a hot drink because it's going to get cold, even in August. Believe me, I've been sat out during the person shivering. Um, and you're probably going to want a notebook or clipboard to record your observations. Uh, and I've said several pens here because I have many times dropped a pen at a critical moment um, and been busy looking down when I should have been looking up. Talking of which way to look, don't look directly at the radiant. Um, a lot of people think that's the best place to look. But if you imagine you're trying to spot an aircraft in the sky and it's flying directly toward you, all you're going to be able to see is the front end of the aircraft. And that's going to be pretty hard to spot. On the other hand, if the aircraft's flying across your line of sight, off to one side, it's easier to see. You'll see it moving against the background sky. And so that's the same kind of thing that you should do with a meteor shower. Look off about 45 degrees away from the radiant, look in the darkest direction for your sky, and look about halfway up from the horizon. And then just kind of let your eyes defocus, just let yourself relax, let your eyes get used to the dark, and just watch and see what you see. Um, if you want to record your observations, the simplest way to record it is what I've noted here. So I just get a, um, a flip, a flip um, notebook. I write down the time and date that I started the observations at the top. And each time I see a meteor, I make a mark on the page. Um, at the end of each hour, I turn the page over. I actually listen for the village clock chiming to know when to turn the, turn the page over. And I start a new page. And then at the end of the evening, when I'm finished observing, I can go inside and I can count up how many meteors there were per hour. And that's exactly the information that we're looking for. Um, you can obviously, if you, as you get a bit more advanced, you can start thinking about making a note of whether you thought it was a shower meteor or a sporadic. Um, you can think about which constellation it was in. But really, for a beginner, the, the best place to start is just a simple count of the meteors per hour. That's the information that, that is really useful for us. And if you do take observations, then you can send them into either Meteor at Pop Astro, um, or you can uh, report things like fireballs via both the Pop Astro website and the UK Meteor Network website. And these reports, by the way, go to the International Meteor Organization, who collate observations from all over the world and all over, all over the, the country. Uh, if you do want to do more complicated uh, reports, there is a, um, a form available on the SPA's website um, where you can record things like the magnitude estimates, uh, constellation that you saw it in, whether you think it was a shower, that kind of thing. But really, don't, don't worry about that if you're just starting out or, or um, um, if, uh, if you just want to have a nice evening sat out under the stars. And I have to just add, um, earlier on, Simon talked about Mary and I. Um, we do get quite competitive when we're meteor spotting. We, we generally sit back to back, um, looking at different parts of the sky. And there'll be a lot of, oh, did you see that one? No, I missed it, blast, kind of thing going on as we, as we try to outdo each other for the number that we spot. But it is quite a fun thing to do with other people. So that's something to think about too. I'm going to talk next about photography. Um, and meteor photography can be extremely rewarding, although it can also be extremely frustrating. Um, and first of all, I want to just mention the equipment that you, you're probably going to need. So the first thing you want is a camera that is capable of taking exposures of between 10 and 30 seconds continuously all night, because the best way to image meteors is just to set your camera up and leave it running. So if it's got a remote shutter cable that you can lock off or you can put an intervalometer on it, or if it's got some kind of mechanism of locking the shutter so it just keeps taking pictures, that's what you want. Um, you want a sturdy tripod so you can keep it nice and steady. Um, and you might also want to think about a dew heater to stop the lens fogging up. Um, some people use a really wide angle lens for meteor hunting. Uh, I don't. I just use the kit lens that came with my camera. If you use a really wide angle lens, the meteors will be very, very small on the image. Um, although you'll get more sky in, 
you probably won't see the faint ones so well. So, you know, have a think about how good your sky is and, and, and vary the lens maybe according to, to the sky conditions. The other thing to mention is uh, if your camera can accept an external power supply, that's probably a good thing because if you're going to leave it running all night, the battery will probably go flat. In terms of settings for your camera, set it to 800 or 1600 ISO and start with a 10 second exposure. Get your focus right and then do a few test exposures to see how, how over or under exposed the sky is. Uh, bear in mind, your sky might be different to mine. You might have less light pollution. You might have more light pollution. So take those test shots and decide what settings are going to work best for you. And then exactly as with visual observing, point away from the radiant, uh, set the camera up, just leave it running all night. Check the focus occasionally, but try not to move the camera. Um, and I'll come on to why, why that's a good idea uh, in a moment. And whilst the camera is taking pictures in one direction, you can look in a different direction. And that way, your eyeballs and your camera will pick up different events and you'll get uh, you know, more interesting uh, evenings observing. These are a few of the sort of pictures that you should be able to take with a, a reasonably de reasonable DSLR. These were all taken, I think, with my wife's uh, 1100D. Uh, so it's not a high-end camera by any means. The other thing I should mention is you might want to think about framing. When you're taking a picture of a meteor, it can look interesting against the dark sky, but sometimes it's useful to have some foreground to give you an idea of scale. So on this picture, you can probably make out the plough on the right-hand side, and there's a tree on the left-hand side. So it tells you how big that meteor was on the sky. And I think that's a, a useful thing to do. Uh, sometimes your framing goes wrong. This lovely picture of a lyrid went right behind a tree at the end. But on the other hand, you can see there's some color in the tail here. The tail looks kind of greenish and the body looks kind of orangish. So that's quite nice too. Um, and this is the reason I mentioned that you probably shouldn't try, shouldn't move the camera during the evening. Um, if you've taken pictures from exactly the same spot all night, you can, at the end of the night, you can make a kind of a star trails with it, a bit like this one that my wife Mary made. And this, you can see half a dozen meteors um, and lots of trailing stars. But I think these pictures are quite interesting too. And they show you something about how the skies evolved as the night goes on. And lastly, again, another example of how you can create quite a nice picture if you frame it properly. This particular picture was taken from both wells um, during Solar Sphere about four years ago, I think. Um, and we set up facing pretty much north um, during the Persids and just left the camera running. And you, you obviously, we got a bit of foreground. We've got an idea of the scale of the meteor on the sky from the size of the plough. And that's the kind of thing that can, that can add interest to your pictures. So it's worth thinking about that kind of thing. Earlier on, I mentioned um, that, you know, obviously half of the meteors that hit the Earth happen during the day, um, and so we can't observe them. That's not entirely true. Um, we can actually observe them with radio. And when I talk about radio astronomy, people immediately start to think of giant dishes like Jodrell Bank or something like that. But in fact, uh, you can observe meteors uh, with a really simple kit that you can put together at home. Um, <clears throat> as me what's happening here is as the meteors burn up in the atmosphere, they heat up the air, obviously, and hot air reflects radio waves better than cold air. So, uh, and obviously those radio waves are also Doppler shifted because the meteor is moving really fast. And so the bounced off waves are, are Doppler shifted by that velocity of the meteor. And so with a homemade antenna and a USB radio receiver that you can pick up for a few pounds off, uh, off your favorite online retailer, um, you can record these sound events um, that are happening when the radio waves are reflected. And because radio works during daytime, through cloud, at night, doesn't matter if it's snowing, you can get 24 hour a day observations from radio uh, detectors. Um, There's a little picture showing what's going on. So you can see there's a transmitter somewhere on the earth, bouncing a radio wave off meteor, uh, and then you're receiving it uh, over at your home receiver. And this picture shows a little dish at the receiver, but actually this is my aerial. I don't know how much you can make out of that in the picture, but my aerial is made out of three pieces of copper pipe and an old piece of wood that I had lying around in the garage. Um, and um, the plans for making this are, are uh, freely available in many places online. But that is perfectly capable of detecting meteors from uh, a space radi radar station called Grave in the south of France. It's about 700 miles away from me, and that's kind of about the right sort of range. Um, so uh, anywhere in the UK, you should be able to, pretty much anywhere in the UK, you should be able to pick up the radio from Grave and, and pick up uh, meteors with this kind of equipment. And this is what the dongle looks like, just to, just to fill in the picture. Just a little tiny USB dongle. I've got it on an extension cable to keep it away from the noise that my PC power supply makes. Um, and then the other end of that is connected to the aerial on the loft. Obviously with 
uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, radar, you are not getting pretty pictures in the same way. This is the sort of picture that you actually get. That flash on the on the left hand side there is uh, the actual meteor uh, burning up in the atmosphere, and that's the Doppler shifted radar signal being picked up by my receiver. You do get sound out of these, and I hope this is going to work. But uh, hopefully, in the background, you can hear the hiss of my radio. And then, in a moment, the, there we go. There was a whistle noise. And that whistle noise is the Doppler shifted signal as the, as the meteor burns up in the atmosphere. So you can get these pictures and you can also get sounds out of a, a radio kit. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've accidentally played it again, so I'm going to let it play. <laughs> um, you can also, with the data, the, the software exists to create something called a heat map. Um, and a heat map is, is probably the best way to visualize what you're seeing with radar. So on the right hand side here, you've got a heat map, which is uh, showing across the top the day of the month and down the left, the hour of the day. On the left hand side, you've got a bar chart showing how many meters were detected each hour of the day. And as you can see there, that, that record starts at midnight and goes all the way through until I think I stopped recording on this particular day at about uh, six o'clock in the evening. But if you look at the heat map, you can clearly see two hot spots on there. And that's actually the Geminid meteor shower. This was from December 2020. And this is showing you the Geminid meteor shower. And I think actually you can also just about make out the Ursids, which happened, I think, on the 22nd. Is that right? I think so. Um, so these are the kinds of things you can get out of, of the radio kit. Uh, there's a couple of other examples of heat maps here. This one is from... Uh, the Persids in 2020. And again, you can see quite a strong signal around the peak of the Persids. Um, and you can also see another interesting effect here, which is the diurnal effect. The top half of the, the heat map, the part that happens between midnight and noon, is bluer than the, the bottom part of the heat map, which happens between noon and midnight. And that's a real effect. And it's due to the fact that the side of the Earth that is facing toward the meteor train, the dust coming in from out from the outer solar system, that side picks up more dust. And so we see more meteors on the side that's facing away from the sun, basically. And that's why you tend to see more uh, between midnight and, and noon. Now, lastly, I'm going to come on to video observing. And this is really what Simon was talking about in the introduction when he talked about the UK Meteor Network and the, the Global Meteor Network. Uh, video observing is something that's that's really kind of taken off in the last few years. As, as Simon mentioned earlier, the number of cameras is, is growing rapidly. When we when I first joined the UK Meteor Network, we had, I think, 12 or 13 cameras in the UK. Uh, as of today, we have over 140 cameras across the UK in the, global, in the UK Meteor Network. And actually, there are more cameras. There are two other networks in the UK as well with cameras, too, um, which I'm not involved with those, but the, those other networks are around as well. Um, and how do we do it? Well, we use cheap security cameras, and you can see an example of one here. This is a, they're about 35 pounds off a, a Chinese retailer. Um, they're actually intended for use as security cameras. They're, they're pretty low resolution, but they're good enough for us. And the good thing about them is they're very light sensitive in the dark. So we can pick up meteors down to about magnitude six, which is about two magnitudes better than the naked eye. Um, the software that, that we're using is open source software developed uh, primarily initially by um, teams from a couple of universities around the world. Um, <clears throat> and what it does is it monitors the camera video stream uh, for detections that look like meteors, and it saves a short video of each one of those detections. Um, it's pretty smart. It, it rejects most of the clouds and birds and aircraft and things that we, uh, we, we get. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And then the results of that are uploaded to uh, servers both here and in Canada for the Global Meteor Network where we do matching on the data. <clears throat> These are a couple of my cameras on the outside of, of my observatory shed, which I really should have painted before I took this picture. Um, but yeah, so I've got, uh, I've got four cameras now um, and an all sky camera, which you can see on the right there. And these are all using the same, same technology, basically. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we, we upload the data to the servers, but as well as the uploaded data, there's also some immediate output that you get from the cameras. So this is what you get if you look at a stack of all the data that you've captured for one night. You can see here a lot of aircraft, a lot of clouds, uh, probably a few meteors. There's certainly some stars in there. And I mentioned before that the software is pretty smart. It will try to eliminate all of the things that aren't meteors. And this is the result that you'll get after you've run that processing. It's all automated, by the way. It does all this cleverly for you. But after that automation has, has been run, you can you can get something like this where you just see the meteors and, and maybe there's one aircraft trail there. But I think that happened during the same frame as a as a meteor. And so we know we've got the meteors. Um, and you can also do nice things like you can plot a little 
uh, sort of all sky map. And this is showing you um, all of the meteors uh, that were detected on this particular camera in one night. And it's classified them according to which meteor shower it thinks they were from. You maybe can't see it on the screen, but each of those little red lines has got a yellow dot at the front of it. That's the lowest point. There's a line tracing back from that in a great circle across the sky. And if that line intersects with a meteor shower uh, radiant, like the green circle, the blue circle, and the orange circle here, then that meteor will be classified, you know, conditionally classified, I should say, as being a Lyrid or an Eta, Lyra, an Eta Aquarid or a Lambda Lyrid in this case. Um, and so that's the kind of thing you can get out of the camera immediately. Um, you can also create some pretty cool all month stacks. This is a stack that I created of all the meteors that I observed in one particular month. So like I mentioned earlier, it gets pretty busy in the sky. There's a lot of meteors that are detected um, during, by our cameras. And this, is a, this was a quiet month um, during something like August or December. Quite often there's seven, 800 meteors been detected in the month by one camera. Uh, you can also create uh, little movies of each meteor detection. If you watch closely, you'll see meteors streaking across the sky here. And the other thing that's worth noticing here is how much cloud there is, and yet the camera has still detected the meteors. And that's because these cameras are really sensitive to infrared, and so they can see through the cloud. You know, the cloud shows up visually, but you can still see meteors streaking across the sky. As long as the camera can pick out 20 stars, it can do its calculations, it can work out the, the trajectory of the meteor, and it can feed the data uh, downstream. And so you can get these uh, pretty cool videos. The other thing that you can produce uh, is um, something like this, which hopefully is going to play for me. Here we go. Um, this is an all night time lapse. So I mentioned before the cameras are capturing video all night. Most of it gets rejected because it doesn't have meteors in. But you can create an all night time lapse from uh, the data as well. And I think these are really cool. Uh, actually, Mary and I tend to watch these over breakfast to see what we've captured. It's getting a bit tricky now we've got four cameras. But um, these kinds of all night time lapses will show you everything that happened in the night. You'll see meteors, uh, you'll see aircraft, you'll see the clouds bubbling up and vanishing, obviously the wheel of the stars. In a moment or two, you're going to see a Starlink pass. There we go, perfectly timed. Um, uh, fortunately, the cameras can eliminate that. Um, and you can see the, you know, the, the moonlight waxing and waning as it goes behind the trees or whatever. And I think these are really fascinating videos to watch. I, I can get quite mesmerized watching what's happening. But they're also useful from the point of view of noticing when there were interesting meteors that you might want to look up in, in the system later to see what they were, see whether they were, they were from a particular shower, uh, how bright they were, um, and we can come on to that later. So you can keep a, an eye on the clock down in the bottom corner there, and you can note the times down that, that some of these events happen, and then you can go back and look them up later. I'll just let this video finish playing because I think they're really cool. Um, and I love watching the clouds just kind of appear from nowhere sometimes and then disappear again. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of weird how they, how they do that. Okay, we're just coming up on Dawn now, so I don't think we're gonna see much more there. <clears throat> um, so that's all being done on the camera or on the Raspberry Pi that, that's running the software that, that connects to the camera. But as I mentioned, we do also upload all the data to our servers for further analysis. And what that analysis is doing is matching up the views from different cameras uh, to see if we can calculate an accurate orbit for the meteor, meteoroid um, that created that meteor. And also so that we can see if we can calculate the trajectory of the meteor through the atmosphere to see if there's any possibility of there being meteorites. So the pictures you can see here are two uh, photographs from different cameras of the same meteor. Uh, ignore the thing that looks like a giant space octopus. That's a, fl a flock of birds flying through the field of view. Um, but you can see the two meteors there. Um, and then when that's put into the analysis routine, it can generate something like this. So at the top, you can see there's a little summary of what that event was. So these particular uh, pictures were of a sporadic meteor traveling at about 58 kilometers per second, uh, about mag 0.9. And there's details of its orbit there. And then down the bottom, you can see a picture of its orbit. So this particular one uh, was probably coming from somewhere out near Saturn, which is, is pretty impressive. Um, <clears throat> I think that, yeah, that's Saturn. Um, so, so we can find out quite a lot about it um, from the details of the orbit that we've calculated there. Um, <clears throat> you can also, as I said, see the ground track of the, the meteor over the surface. Now, this particular meteor burned up at about 95 kilometers altitude, so there's no chance of any uh, meteorites being dropped. But even if there were, in this particular case, the track was over the uh, English Channel. Uh, the, the cross indicates the lowest point on the track, and the green line indicates the track on, on the sky. The other three markers are the positions of some of the cameras that detected it. Um, I think, in this case, two of the cameras were at the same location. 
Um, so that's the kind of thing that we can do on, on the server automatically. Um, we can also produce uh, graphs showing all the activity that we observed across the whole UK for a particular meteor shower. So this is all the observed activity for the Lyrids, um, I think, uh, last year. Um, this is count of meteors per hour uh, that we've seen over the nights that the shower was active. Um, this is a, a plot of magnitude um, uh, showing how what the magnitude distribution was. This is showing you where the radiant of the shower was. Um, Sorry, this is showing me the radiant of the shower was. And we can do other things as well. There's all sorts of other graphs we can produce and, and we publish all of that on the UK Media Network website for those that might be interested. Um, the data is also used for research purposes. Um, so uh, there have been several discoveries made by looking at this data now. Um, Sometimes we're able to see enhancements in meteor activity. So by studying the, the data, we can tell whether there's been something like an, outbur an outburst of a meteor shower that we weren't expecting. Um, and this example from a couple of years ago, uh, Paul Rogermans is, is one of my colleagues in the Global Meteor Network, uh, led a team that did some analysis of uh, data from uh, a couple of networks uh, that found an, an enhancement in a particular meteor shower. Um, Colleagues in Japan did some research on their data, looking back over many years worth of data, in fact. Um, there was an outburst of the beta toucanism, which was found again by looking at this data. And more recently, there was a new meteor shower discovered by our colleagues in Canada, again, looking at the data that's being generated by these cameras. And actually, since that discovery, there's been another new meteor shower found by the same team. So there's some real science research being done from this information, which I think is also absolutely fascinating that we're genuinely contributing to real research uh, with the work that we're doing with these, these amateur cameras. And actually, that brings me on nicely to Winchcombe, which I, I promised I would mention earlier on. Um, <clears throat> so as I'm sure you all know, um, that Winchcombe was an amazing event that happened a couple of years ago now, or a year ago now. Um, but it's worth noting that uh, about two years ago, uh, we set up something called the UK Fireball Alliance. And the UK Fireball Alliance was set up uh, after a, a number of conversations that we'd had amongst meteor groups in, in the UK. We realized we didn't have any kind of plan for what we would do if there was a bright meteorite event, if there was a potential for meteorites being recovered in the UK. And we realized that we needed to have some kind of a plan. And so we set up something called the UK Fireball Alliance. I, I wasn't actually involved in setting it up, some of my colleagues were. Um, and uh, the idea was to coordinate between the networks and coordinate globally to help identify the potential um, fall zone for meteorites. And of course, we were extremely lucky in that only a few months later, in fact, um, we had the Winchcombe event, which was picked up on multiple cameras from the Global Meteor Network, from the UK Meteor Network, from Fripon, uh, which is a French network, from Nematode and from SCAMP, which are both other networks based in the UK. And UK Fireball Alliance was able to rapidly bring all that data together from all the camera operators and all the networks. And then that information was sent to research teams in Australia, Canada, and in the UK for detailed analysis. And we got three independent sets of analyses back and a kind of a blended result uh, was generated. That's a view from one of the other networks cameras. Um, and that helped us identify a strewn field really within a few hours of the meteor being, meteor being spotted in the sky. And that's extraordinary. Um, that would just not have been possible without these video networks. And that, again, is something that, that's a major contribution that they're capable of making. Um, and the other thing that's incredible is just how small that strewn field zone was. And this is a, the picture that you probably all saw in the papers. It's not very big. It's only a few miles across and a few miles long. And to narrow down the zone where we thought meteorites might be found to, to some area that small that quickly uh, is a really impressive piece of work by the research teams involved. And of course, as a result of that, uh, we did find meteorites. Now, of course, we couldn't go there because it was right in the middle of COVID. Uh, Mary and I live oh, about 30 miles east, uh, east of uh, this area. Uh, you guys probably aren't that far away either. Um, and we would have loved to have gone across there literally the same night to start fingertip searching the fields in the dark if necessary. But of course we couldn't because of COVID. Um, so instead we ran a publicity campaign on the TV and the radio and, the, and in the press to try and encourage people to go out and to look for fragments of meteor and we explained what they should do if they did find them, uh, how they should handle it and who to report it to. Um, and we were very lucky in that we actually did get a call. The, uh, actually, my, one of my colleagues in the UK Meteor Network got a call the next day from the family in, uh, in Winchcombe that found the, the, the fragment in their driveway. So we passed that information on via UK Fall to the Natural History Museum. Uh, they sent a specialist out to investigate. 
Um, and once the find was confirmed, uh, teams from across the UK got permission from the Home Office to carry out a fingertip search of the fields and woods. And it really was a fingertip search. I'm sure you've seen the photographs, but people were genuinely like a police search line across the fields going around feeling in the grass. Um, and and it's, uh, it's, it's amusing, I suppose, to mention that um, th these are sheep fields. Um, and there's something else that you find in sheep fields that's small and black. Um, and we found an awful lot of that, I'm afraid. Um, but we did recover about 500 grams of genuine meteorite in the end. I, I, I personally wasn't able to go. Uh, I say we, the team, uh, the team who were primarily from universities around the UK, but there were also many amateurs involved. They did recover about 500 grams in the end. And actually, that's really interesting, too, because the analysis that had been done earlier on suggested that the initial mass um, or the mass at the end of the burn-up process of the meteor uh, was probably around 600 grams, somewhere between 600 and 800 grams, I think. So the fact that we've recovered 500 grams is pretty amazing. It means we've probably recovered most of it. There are probably still some bits lodged in hedges and dung heaps and river bottoms and that kind of thing, which we'll never recover. Um, but to get 500 grams so quickly was a major achievement. And quickly is important in this situation because as, as I'm sure you all know, this is a carbonaceous chondrite. This is one of the rarest sorts of meteorite. But these sorts of meteorites decay really quickly. And so by finding it so quickly, we were able to get pretty much pristine material. It hadn't been rained on. It hadn't sat in a hedge for weeks. It hadn't been sniffed or licked or picked up or handled by animals or, or anything like that. Um, and so it was pretty pristine. And that's super important for the research that can now be done on it. And I'm going to briefly mention some of that research. Um, so uh, there are a number of teams around the UK who are still conducting research on this material. I believe there are a couple of papers that should be coming out this year um, looking at uh, different aspects of it. Uh, but there are teams looking at the chemistry, the mineral structure, the, the physical structure, where it might have come from. I think we've got a good idea now where it might have come from. I think there's a paper being published fairly soon about that. Um, we've also been studying the organic compounds and so on and so on. And these are three pictures of pieces of the meteor. You've probably seen two of these already many times in the press. The one at the bottom right is a picture of Ashley King's computer screen um, showing a slice through the Winchcombe meteorite. Now, if you look at that slice and you compare it to the little specimen that I have in my collection, you can see the similarities between these two. They've got the same kinds of structure. So that, that's one of the things that tells us they're both chondrites. Um, but again, by studying the compositions of the individual fragments that you can see here, we can learn an enormous amount about where this meteorite came from, how long it's been floating around, the conditions it might have formed under, uh, you know, whether there are parts of it that are predate the, the birth of the sun. There's a whole bunch of things that we can determine from this. And there's some fascinating research going to come out of this over the next wee while. And so I'm going to finish by just replaying this video that I'm sure you've seen many, many times um, of the actual event itself. And this in itself is quite interesting because you, first of all, you can notice this is quite a slow moving event. And it's also coming in at what looks like quite a shallow angle. And actually that's crucial. Um, this meteorite did come in slowly and it did come in at a shallow angle. And if it had come in steeper or if it had come in faster, it probably wouldn't have survived to ground level. It only survived because of those conditions. When a meteorite hits the atmosphere, it compresses the air in front of it. And that shock wave causes the meteor to shatter. And you can see actually several explosion events taking place there. And each of those led to a different little cluster of falls on the ground, which were recovered later. But if that pressure had been higher, it would have smashed the thing to pieces and we would not have recovered anything. So that's a that's a, a, um, a really good demonstration of, of what we've learned so far um, about the Winchcombe event. And I'm going to stop there. Um, I've probably talked for long enough and my voice is definitely starting to get quite croaky. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about what I do for meteor hunting, there's information on my website. Uh, you can also uh, look on the SPA's website uh, or the UK Meteor Network or the Global Meteor Work Network website. And I'm happy to share links with any of these uh, afterward if anybody uh, would like more information. And so I've come to the end of my talk. I'm going to stop there um, and um, back to you, Simon, for whether there's any questions. Excellent. Yes, Mark. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm sure we've got a few questions. Um, so uh, uh, who would like to ask a, a question of Mark? Um, meteor related, meteorite related. Um, I'm still actually uh, sort of where you, you, you hinted that we knew where the winch come had come from. Do you actually, do you know? I have seen um, a preprint. Uh, but I can't talk about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> You'd have to kill us if you told us. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it is. It is still. It's still a preprint. It's still being reviewed. So I can't see any more than that, really. Excellent. So what questions you got, Prim? Uh, thank you for that, Mark. It's a really interesting talk. Uh, if you were to sit out in an evening and there wasn't a meteor power um, scheduled for that time of year, is there any particular direction that you would look at? You said 45 degrees if there was a meteor shower um, from the radiant, but what if there wasn't a shower scheduled? No, I mean, sporadic meteors can come from absolutely any direction at all. Um, and so what I would suggest is look in whatever direction is darkest. Um, you know, just just uh, for us, that's to the north. So if I was going to go out and look for sporadics, I would sit and look to the north. So just choose a direction that's nice and dark, that nobody's going to suddenly turn a security light on and blind you in. Um, and, um, and just wait. I mean, you should see, you know, a few an hour. They're probably quite faint ones. Funny enough, actually, this time of year is, is sometimes called fireball season. And we do often see fireballs in, in February and March. I don't quite know why. There's no kind of physical reason for it. I suspect it's just there are no showers and therefore we notice them more. But, you know, um, just the darkest direction. And, and just to follow up, do you think um, that you said... Um, well, Simon seemed to think there were like a hundred of these cameras before. Do you think the Winchcombe event kind of got people excited and so loads of people went out and got more cameras? Absolutely, yes. We, we saw an explosion of interest immediately after, after Winchcombe. And one of the great things about these cameras, though, is that they're pretty self-maintaining. Once you've got them up and running, um, there's a lot of automation in them. So and not high maintenance and that's really important for us because you know we're, we're we've got a lot of amateurs um some actually non-astronomers we have a stonemason who has set up a camera uh, down in cornwall um and um and he needed quite a lot of hand holding as you can imagine getting set up because he was not at all techie but that's 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 certainly what we saw a huge explosion of interest immediately after winchcombe but as i said they're pretty self-maintaining which is very important for us uh, almost self-maintaining. Mine ran out of this space, um, and uh, I got an email to say your camera's been offline for ten days. Um, and so, yeah, so you do have to just pop on occasionally to uh, uh, yes. do a bit of housekeeping. Yeah, uh, they're not they're not entirely self-maintaining, but they're 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 pretty they're pretty good. Uh, um, one of the things you can get is a pretty diagram of the coverage from all these mm. cameras. Um, so when I last looked at it, they were just coming up to 100 cameras. So we, we must have blatted nearly all of the UK, haven't we, with coverage? I will see if I can find, uh, I'll stop sharing and I'll see if I can find a picture um, from the website. But yes, we absolutely have. Uh, the coverage is now uh, pretty intense. Um, it's almost, I guess, almost too much. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna be able to find a picture, I don't think. No, I can't find it. Sorry, um, I'll have to. I'll have to find it some other time. But yeah, the um, the coverage is pretty intense now. Uh, we are covering uh, almost all the UK, apart from the very end of Cornwall um, and some parts of Scotland, which we're working on. However, that shouldn't discourage anybody who's interested in setting one up, because the more cameras we have. Um, the more angles we get on an event. Now, if you think back to my presentation, I don't know if you remember the very first slide that I showed, the, the, the introduction slide, that was actually my view of the Winchcombe event. And all I saw was a big kind of boom in the sky because we were looking straight at it. We were looking straight at the front end of that, that event. So our camera was useless. We couldn't do anything with our data. The best views were the ones that were a, a reasonable distance away looking sideways on. Um, and, and that's actually um, really important. So if there, there's another fireball, the cameras closest to it may not be much use. And the more cameras we have, the better angles we get on it and the better uh, data we'll get at the end of it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I, have one. I have a question. Well, let's go for Charles and then we'll go for Richard, okay? Okay. I mean, first to comment, actually, I mean, in terms of just seeing meteors, I remember years and years ago when I was first observing with Simon, um, I, we had, I had a telescope <clears throat> at Willow, and Simon didn't have one at the time, and I was staring down eyepieces, trying to find stuff, and Simon kept seeing meteors. <laughs> so one simple answer is just keep looking up. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> astronomers, um, <laughs> um, my question is this. 
it's a business about working out where um, where meteors or meteoroids like came from, and the business about saying, well, you can you know um, look at the minerals that you see in 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 the in the meteorite, um, <clears throat> and work out from that that came from say Mars or Venus or whatever. But surely all these planets have quite varied geology. You can say, they do. Uh, so how can you be sure, you know, that it's <clears throat> from that particular planet rather than just a different part of, uh, of another planet? I've never quite understood that. Well, that, that's an interesting question. So they do have different geologies, but they also have different uh, isotope ratios of key elements. So oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. This is perhaps quite a technical point, but oxygen comes in a number of different isotopes and that's just basically how many neutrons yeah. there are in, in the nucleus yeah. and the ratio of, of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 depends upon where the oxygen is in the solar system and so if you look at uh, that oxygen line uh, for stuff that comes from the earth you get a line a particular part of a graph if you look at the ratio for things that come from mars it's on a different part of the graph the moon is very similar to the earth uh, the outer planets, um, asteroids are different again. So that's one of the things that we can do. It's 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 quite detailed analysis. And you're absolutely right. I mean, you could look at a rock from I don't know um, Devon and a rock from Scotland, and they would look extremely different. But they would still have very similar, or if not the same, oxygen isotope ratios. So those are the kinds of chemical things that we can do that that uh, help us distinguish. Okay, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I've got um, two questions. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk. So the first one is um, a rather mercenary question, which is, um, I think meteorites you know, are quite valuable. So I'd be interested in um, your understanding of that. And in, in particular, um, whether the Winchcombe guy whose uh, driveway the, um, uh, uh, got damaged got any recompense for his trouble, particularly as I understand uh, some of it's been dug up and put in the Natural History Museum. And then um, the second question, more um, scientific, serious question is, um, can you tell anything from the, the, the spectra of, of meteor trails? Yeah. So do the second question first. Um, yes, absolutely, you can. Um, there's a chap called Bill Ward, who was one of my predecessors in the SPA meteor section. Um, he actually does quite a lot of me meteor spectroscopy. I think he's Meteor Bill on Twitter. Um, and yes, definitely, you can tell something from the composition. Um, it, it's quite difficult to get a decent spectrum of a meteor um, for obvious reasons. They're random. They don't really occur in the same place in the sky. Uh, I have actually have a spectroscope set up in on one of my spare cameras in the observatory, which I'm really hoping I'll get a spectrum from at some point. No luck so far. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. And, and I, I, I guess that before we actually were able to bring back specimens from outer space, that was one of the ways that we would have studied uh, the composition. The other question about cost is really interesting. The vast majority of meteorites are not that valuable. You know, if I think again back to the classifications that we had earlier, the stony meteorites, the stony iron, iron meteorites, they're only really valuable if they're part of some major event. So if you had like a, a one kilogram chunk of one of the big, big meteors that fell in South America or something like that, that would definitely be worth a reasonable sum of money. But the pieces that I've got in my collection are worth a few pounds. Um, the Winchcombe one um, is, a, is an interesting case study. Almost everybody who on whose land, so ownership of a meteorite is with the person whose land it lands on. So if, it, if, if you are the landowner, it's yours. Uh, it's up to you to decide what you do with it. Um, so if you rent a house, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the person who owns the house. Um, it's something that people have occasionally got wrong. But almost everybody who, on whose land a part of Winchcombe was found donated it to the Natural History Museum, donated it to science. Um, and um, the only thing that they've really got by way of recompense is I think the Natural History Museum paid to have their drive fixed um, and their names are all on the plaque in the Natural History Museum. Now, personally, having my name on a plaque in the Natural History Museum would be <laughs> way more, way more valuable than any money. <laughs> but <laughs> we live in hope. Um, do, do insurance companies uh, regard it as a natural god? 
I, I honestly don't know. Um, it's not, I, I would I would be very happy to find out by having one come through my roof, but, Indeed, yeah. but, but I never have. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the fragments of Winchcombe that were not handed in did sell for quite a lot of money because obviously it's a famous and rare example. Um, and I know a couple of people that did, did buy pieces um, for sums of money that I would not have paid for it. Uh, but by and large, yeah, I mean, you know, most of the meteorites that I've got are a few pounds here and there. So even Chelybinsk wasn't that expensive. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I had a dumb question. <laughs> you like those type of questions? There are no dumb questions. Uh, I think they could be. Is it possible for um, the trail or the streak across the sky, particularly from a very bright meteor or potential fireball, to be curved? And I think I know the answer. Well, they, they, initially they'll be pretty straight because the meteor is going so fast that it just leaves a straight line. But once they start to evolve, they definitely form a kind of wispy, curvy shape. Um, the the example that uh, I saw on Twitter the other day was was it started off dead straight and then within a few seconds it was, you know, all over the place. Um, and uh, Mary took a picture of uh, one a few years ago that was very definitely curved. But it tends to be straight when it forms. Hmm. Well, I saw something in the sky the other night and I was it definitely wasn't an aircraft and it was the right sort of speed possibly to be a very bright meteor but it was slightly odd that uh, either I'd had too many gin and tonics but it definitely seemed to sort of curve off at the end which I thought was a bit unusual so I wondered if it might have been sort of like a, a rocket trail or something like that or a satellite yeah. rather than perhaps a meteor. It could have been. Um, it's it's difficult to tell. I mean, you you need if, if you've got photographic evidence of it, then it's, it can be studied. But uh, it's, it's difficult to tell just from a visual observation, unfortunately. Um, there's many a time I've seen something and then I thought afterwards, I really wish I'd taken a picture of that because I've got no idea what I saw. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe in UFOs, so it wasn't one of those. No, anyway. no. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Mark, I was once introduced to a chap. Uh, he had a gadget in front of his camera that span so that when he was doing his meteor shots, you could actually work out the speed of the meteor. Does anyone still do that kind of thing? Mostly no. I mean, you, certainly that's how one used to do it. You'd have like almost like a little fan that, that just chopped the, the, the video up into, uh, you know, tenth of a second intervals or something. In fact, interestingly, the RMS cameras internally do something pretty much like that. They've got what they've got a rolling shutter. And so um, although they're 720 pixels high, uh, one row at a time is read every 25th of a second. Every 25th of a second, it scans the whole screen, but one row at a time. So each row corresponds to one 720th of one 25th of a second of time. And that is allowing us to do exactly the same thing as that spinning uh, fan on the front of the camera that you would have seen in, in olden days. Um, I, I, have still, I have seen designs for that, but I don't think anybody does it nowadays because electronic cameras now can do that internally. Okay, that's a gadget I'm not going to make then. <laughs> I have seen them on all sky cameras actually, because all sky cameras generally aren't able to do that kind of analysis. So that's somewhere that I have sometimes seen them on. So, uh, how do the all sky cameras come into some of these networks? Are they uh, compared to these sort of more limited field of view shots? They are sometimes useful, but they tend to have such a huge amount of distortion because obviously they're they're 180 degrees that it's extremely difficult to correct for that distortion one of the one of the most complex things that we have to do with the rms cameras is correct for lens distortion and there's a seventh order polynomial fit that is done to the the data so we basically we take a picture of all the stars we can see we know where they should be so we have to undistort the picture to stretch them all back into the right position and doing that is quite difficult doing it on an all sky camera is extremely difficult and earlier on i mentioned about using a wide angle lens versus a narrower angle lens for uh ordinary photography of meteors same problem again there that a really wide angle lens like an all sky camera the meteors will be much fainter because you're spreading out the photons over a, over a, over a larger amount of space. And so you tend to miss the faint ones. Uh, we do sometimes use pictures of very bright bolides um, for uh, that kind of imagery. Um, but by and large, all sky cameras are not great for, uh, for accurate meteor detection. Just on the terminology there, what is the difference between a fireball and a bolide and a meteor sort of, how does that, is there a real definition how do you separate the, those different terms? 
I, I don't think I don't think there's much of a difference between a fireball and a bow light. I think they're just different words for the same thing. A fireball is technically anything that's visually brighter than magnitude minus four. Um, so that's quite difficult to estimate visually, but a bow light is just a really big fireball, I guess. Um, I can see that there's a couple of questions in the chat, which I might not have answered. Adil Desai has asked me, what's my experience with smoke trails from bow lights? Um, so I can answer that. Yes, definitely. I mean, as, as we've just been discussing, I've definitely seen them. Um, my wife's got a cracking video that she took a couple of years ago of a, a, the smoke trail from behind a, a meteor. And as I mentioned, uh, Jürgen Dürr in uh, Germany um, shared a video on the Global Meteor Network group recently where he showed uh, the smoke trail behind uh, uh, an enormous bow light that he picked up um, over Germany about two weeks ago. Um, very interesting to see that kind of thing. Any other questions from the crowd? Oh yeah? Yeah, I've got another one, which might be another follow-up dumb question, but I'll go for it anyway. It's about the identification or the finding of them. When you were talking about the classification earlier on, Mark, you showed one which was a, a size of a grain of sand. Mm. Uh, I can't begin to imagine how anyone found that and didn't think it's a grain of sand. <laughs> I think in that case, it's probably a chip off a larger sample. Right. So um, meteorite um, sellers will usually buy, you know, fairly chunky samples, maybe, you know, 10, 20 grams of something, and then they'll chip it into smaller pieces for resale, um, particularly if it's a, if it's a, a very interesting or very valuable uh, meteor, uh, meteorite, they will tend to break it up because um, they can get more money for it that way, frankly. But even so, most, most of them must still look to most people like rock, just rocks. I'm still amazed yeah. they just picked up. Yeah, and if I, again, if I go back to what I said earlier on at the start about the number of uh, meteors that we think, or the, the, the tonnage of meteors that we think hit the atmosphere every year, the vast majority of those burn up completely. There will be many that, that end up the size of a grain of sand and just land in a grassy field or in the sea or on a beach and are never found. You know, I, I can't remember exactly how many meteorites globally there are in, in the collections now, but it's only measured in a few tens of thousands, I think. And if you think that probably there are millions of, of meteors hit the atmosphere every year. We're only recovering a tiny, tiny fraction of that. And absolutely the vast majority land in places that are never noticed. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting thing you can actually do if you, if you, um, you can read about it online, but you can actually take the dirt out of your gutter uh, and search through it. And you will find some micrometeorites in there, just tiny grain of sand sized meteorites. Um, which otherwise would have gone completely unnoticed. It's getting harder to find these now because there's so many other sources of metallic junk that get into our atmosphere. Um, but it is still possible to, to dig around in, in your gutters and, and find some little meteorites. Great, thank you. Mark, can I, can I ask another one? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, with, with all those millions of meteorites hitting the Earth, how are they not destroying loads and loads of satellites that are going around the Earth? For surely they would, you would think that a lot of them would be taken out. I think I think the answer to that is that space is bigger than we we perhaps realise. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier on about you know if you went and stood on an asteroid today in the asteroid belt, you wouldn't be able to see any other asteroids. They're about a million kilometres apart. Uh, obviously, these grains of dust are, are closer together than that, but typically they're still many many thousands of kilometres apart, if not tens of thousands of kilometres apart. Um, and the distance between satellites is pretty large. Now, I do think it's an interesting point. I think as we get more satellites up there, you know, these mega constellations that are going up, please don't get me started on mega constellations. Um, as we get more and more of those, I think we will start to see more damage. We do see damage now, actually. The ISS has been hit a few times by micrometeorites. Um, there was a satellite that I believe was actually taken out of commission when it was hit by quite a large chunk of, of something, probably asteroid. Uh, but so, I mean, something the size of, you know, a grain of sand hitting a satellite's um, solar panels at uh, 50 kilometers a second is going to make a pretty impressive hole in it. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely an issue. Um, we need to be, you know, thinking about building our satellites in a different way, um, slightly more robust. I, I do question whether we need quite so many as well. Um, and I think it's going to become more of a problem as we get bigger and bigger constellations up there. So I just want to ask a question. Um, with all this data that you've got 140 cameras coming through, don't your servers melt down when you have the um, Perseid Meteor Show? Yeah, last year's Perseid Meteor Show was pretty impressive. Um, it took, we, we captured 16,000 uh, detections uh, over one night. Um, and uh, the, the server was running, it took two and a half days to process the data. I've since up to, had to upgrade the server significantly. Um, 
it's uh, it's an interesting problem actually because um we don't get any kind of funding from any central bodies to run our system um and so it's funded by the members basically um and uh i have to balance between the cost of doing things quickly uh, versus the, the impact on members pockets um uh, but at the moment I'm running, uh, the overnight processing is running on a 32 core machine with 64 gigs of memory, I think. So it's, it's quite chunky. Um, I wouldn't like to run it on anything faster than that. The, the one great advantage of the way that we've built the UK Meteor Network is that it's all using cloud compute. So it's extremely easy for, for us to upgrade if we do need to. So if next year's Persids, if I think we need to, just for a couple of nights, run on a much bigger computer, I could swap that in in a matter of minutes, really. Um, that's one of the great advantages of, of the modern computing world. Excellent. Any final questions before we close the evening tonight? No? Okay, well, I'd like to th thank Mark for uh, coming along despite COVID. Um, fighting through um, a few crackles in the voice, but um, um, not too bad. And uh, thanks for soldering on. Whatever you do, don't give it to Mary, because I will never forgive you if you do. Um, <laughs> you gave us a wonderful insight because uh, we had Tim Gregory talking to us before Christmas about um, meteorites and about the sort of the history and going back in time and sort of pre solar clouds. And so you brought it all the way through to actually what we can do and looking out from more practical side of things. So that's great. And so you've given us the entire thing. We're probably not going to do meteorites and meteors for a little while. Uh, we'll have a bit of a rest of it, but it's absolutely great. And your energy and enthusiasm keep all the good work going with the um, uh, networks. And if anyone wants to install a camera, we've got eight already in Bath. Um, but if anyone's uh, really keen, then I can, they can go to your website um, or they just come to me because I've got five of the eight. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, so thanks so much for your time. Hands, please, and uh, I'll say thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Okay, good night, everyone. I uh, hope to see you soon, maybe on one of those events on Fridays, maybe on the observing. Uh, sessions. Uh, if you want to hang around and just chat, I'll be around here for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, everyone else, you can pop off and I'll, I'll hopefully see you very soon. Night night Bye. and enjoy April.